Good morning and welcome to worship. Today we welcome Steve Bearfield, sitting over here on the, I guess you'd it'd be my left, to be our speaker this morning. Steve's a good friend of mine. And uh, we both experienced knee replacement this past year or the year before, whenever it was. And so we kind of uh, check up on each other every once in a while. Proclaim the glory and strength of God. The spirit and of creation has recreated us. Rejoice in the Holy Spirit who gives us, did I turn that on? Okay. Who gives us life. We remember our baptism and are thankful. God has blessed us. Would you please join in the responsive call to worship? The voice of the Lord, strong and mighty, powerful and full of majesty. It calls to us, calling across the The voice of the Lord breaks forth. It gives us strength and blessing, causing us to shout, glory to the name of the Lord. Let us pray. God, who watches over us, offering us light and hope, be with us this day as we recall the story of Jesus' baptism. Help us to remember your healing, cleansing, and claiming love for us. Remind us again of the many ways in which you reach out to us. May the image of the waters be for us an image of hope. Bring us closer to you, loving God. Embrace us again with your love. We open our hearts to you this day. Amen. Would you please stand and join in the first hymn of praise, holy God, we praise thy name. <laughs>
the one who was without sin received the baptism of repentance so that we who have sinned may be covered by his righteousness. The Spirit enables us to tell the truth of our brokenness, assured already of the grace we know in Jesus Christ. Let us confess first together with a printed prayer of confession and then individually silent in silence. Let us pray. Lord, you have blessed us with life. We praise you for this blessing. What we have done with our lives has both delighted and perplexed you. We are far too often inclined to be stubborn and arrogant, believing that we are all powerful, that we have no need for you. But there is an emptiness in us, a place where we are raw and hurting, bleeding and bruised. We have tried our own healing methods and they have not worked. We feel as though we are an oarless, sailless boat drifting in water, unable to gain direction, unable to see the shore. We long for home and hope. From across these waters, you have called us. Now let us come to you in contrition, seeking your healing and forgiving love as we turn to you with our silent confession. Amen. The heavens part, the waters swirl, and the dove descends, reminding us that we, too, are God's beloved children. We are covered by God's grace and forgiven in Jesus Christ. Amen. seated. Children want to come down front? Let us pray. God of wisdom, send your Holy Spirit upon us to show us your word and show us your way. Amen. Welcome, Steve. Well, good morning. My pleasure to be here today. Uh, as Ron mentioned, we... Uh, had a knee replacement a couple years ago, and we kind of went through physical therapy at the same time. And after you're done with uh, physical therapy, they give you a T-shirt. I was kind of thinking we should get a Purple Heart or something after, after, the, after that situation. I do want to thank the girls for not turning the mic on when I was singing, so but we didn't clear the church out before I had the message today. But uh, again, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Yeah, well, that's probably not going to happen in the best interest of the congregation. So what do you think of when you hear the word perfect? I want to take a short survey today. Is anyone here perfect? Does anyone have a perfect spouse? Does anyone have a spouse that thinks they're perfect? Always get laughs with that one. So in sports, a perfect game in bowling is 300. 
get 12 strikes in a row. A pitcher throws a perfect game in baseball when no one reaches base, no hits, no walks, no errors. A perfect diamond is flawless, not one imperfection. In the Olympics, in diving, skating, and gymnastics, a perfect score is 10. That means the athlete performed without one fault. A perfect complexion, not one wrinkle or spot. My wife Marcia's mom one time made the perfect apple pie. There was, and I can still remember today, it's like there was something about it that was just, it tasted perfect. And we can be obsessed with perfection in life. Uh, and being around perfectionists can be exhausting. Has anyone seen the movie The Perfect Storm? It's about fishermen who are out in the ocean and they go to a different spot to catch fish and then a huge storm blows up between where they're fishing and back to the harbor and they decide to go through the storm and it's a kind of a combination of perfect atmospheric conditions and weather and wind speed and it becomes a perfect storm. And uh, occasionally the Weather Channel will have specials on storms of all, the greatest storms of all time. We know storm hunters fly into the eye of hurricanes to gather data on storms. Weather-related storms can come in all sizes and shapes. We were just, I don't know about you, but as I was preparing to speak today, I was watching the, the Weather Channel. You know, which way is the storm going to track? Are we going to get one to two? three to four, six to seven, and everything's conjecture, really. But uh, a lot of times that storms can be predicted. We've all lived through them. Tornadoes, hurricanes, snowstorms, windstorms, it's likely we've lived through many of them. And with the technology that we have today, we can predict storms well in advance. How much snow we're gonna get, kind of where the storm is going to be tracking, uh, a lot of things are at our disposal through early warning systems. But what about the storms in life? What about those storms? Because they can come out of the blue, can't they? Some storms in life can be very quick hitting. Others can be painstakingly slow moving. But a lot of times our storms can be very unpredictable. Today we can receive up to the minute forecasts on TV, our computers, and even on our cell phones. Here's the prediction for storms in our lives, 100%. We'll get them. Maybe we're going through them now, but we'll get them sooner or later. It's not if they will come, but when they will come. And there are elements of perfect storms in our lives that are similar, not so much about barometric pressure or wind speed or atmospheric conditions, but most of the storms in our lives occur in these areas. First is health. Maybe you're waiting on some medical test results, going through chemo for cancer or in constant pain. The area of health can be a real major storm in our lives and finances the loss of a job or maybe retirement funds are being depleted, the house needs a new roof or the kids need braces. There's always something, isn't it? And then how about emotional storms when we have anxiety and stress and we can't sleep and things just aren't going right? Or relational storms when there's divorce or situations with friends or family members that aren't smooth and maybe even spiritual storms when we have feel that our faith has bottomed out, or maybe it's difficult for us to pray or even think about going to church. It's always something, isn't it, in life? In the midst of our perfect storms, God has the solution. God's word has, also has a lot to say about perfection. In Isaiah 26.3, God's word tells us that you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Do you think that that's actual po actually possible to live in perfect peace regardless of the circumstances in life that are surrounding us? Notice in that verse there are no conditions, no restrictions on the size of the storm or the circumstances. 
but God will give us rock solid stability if we but focus on him. And it's so easy to look at the storm, to look at the conditions, to look at the circumstances and lose track of where we should be looking. In Hebrews 12 2, God's word says that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And if you recall the story of Peter, the disciples were sent out on a boat across the Sea of Galilee and a storm came up in the middle of the night, a terrible storm and they were frightened and they saw Jesus walking on the water and Peter got out of the boat and asked Jesus if it was him to call him to him. And Jesus said, come to me. And Peter got out of the boat and miraculously, he's walking on the water. Nobody does that, right? When he focused on Jesus, he was fine. But then he started feeling the wind in his face. He saw the waves, waves lapping at his legs. And all of a sudden, he went down because he lost his focus on Jesus. And isn't that the way it is with us too? We can be easily distracted and easily discouraged and easily angered and easily up and down with the things that life throws us. In 1 John 4, 16, God's word says, a perfect love casts out fear. I don't know about you, but I'm not comfortable around a lot of things. I'm not crazy about heights or I'm, I don't like snakes too much. And, and I, you know, there are probably some other things that I'm not... Uh, don't feel comfortable around, but God's love casts out all of our fears. And Satan wants us to be fearful. Satan wants us to worry about things that are gonna be happening. He wants us to worry about things that we've done in the past and what's happening to us today. And he wants us to worry about the things in the future, things that we have no control over. God's love casts out those fears. In 2 Samuel twenty two thirty one, 31, God's word says, as for God, his way is perfect. And I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when I can look back and think of things that happened and I don't understand them. And I don't know why God permitted them to happen. And still to this day, I don't understand. And there was a time probably when going through those situations when I was praying for something and God answered exactly the opposite of what I wanted him to. But God's way is perfect. And we sometimes want God to do the things that we want in our own time schedule. As for the storms in our lives, Isaiah 25, four says that for you have been a defense for the helpless and needy, a refuge from the storm. And doesn't it feel occasionally like it's not one storm, it's one thing after the other. I was at the beach one time and I like to um, body surf or do the boogie board thing. And you know, when you're doing that, you want the waves to be pretty good. And this one particular day, the waves were really good. And I got on top of a wave and when it crashed, I crashed with it. I was tumbling around and it was like my legs were everywhere and I had no completely no control. And sometimes storms can feel like that. It's like we're inundated by something. All the things that I just meant that mentioned, health, finances, emotional, sometimes it's one after the other. But God's word tells us that he is a, refu a refuge from the storm. And we know what those are. It's a place of safety. It's a place of shelter where he keeps us from storms. In Hebrews 6.19, God's word says he is an anchor in the storms. And like I was being tossed about by that wave, when God is our anchor, he stabilizes us. That's what anchors are designed to do. When you drop the anchor, the boat stays there. God gives us a stability in our lives through storms. Would you agree with me today that there should be a drastic difference from the way Christians and unbelievers act and live? I think we would all agree with that, right? And I believe the Bible calls it being set apart from the world. And can I share with you two things that I feel most clearly should separate us from those that don't believe in God. And those two things are peace and joy. And we're kind of after New Year's, but between Thanksgiving and Christmas, 
we're inundated with feelings of peace and joy, right? And sometimes we're not there. You know, we, it's almost like we feel pressured to be peaceful and joy. And we always know around Thanksgiving, you know, the predecessor for Christmas is what? Hallmark movies, right? They start coming out 24 seven and we know that Hallmark movies are very predictable. After the first couple minutes, you know what's gonna happen, right? You know, um, the guy and the girl are gonna get together. There'll be a time in the middle where something bad happens. And then at the end, there, there'll be snowflakes on Christmas Eve and everybody lives happily ever after, right? That's Hallmark. Um, but, so let's talk about peace first. Um, are you a worrier? Do you worry about things? Are you anxious about things? Um, do, you, do concerns keep you up at night? Um, now there's so many medications for stomach acid and get, getting help, helping us go to sleep at night. Uh, and there's a lot to worry about, isn't there? If we lose focus on Christ. And in, in Psalm 139, David asked God to search me and know my anxious thoughts. He had them too, and God knows what our anxious thoughts are. It might be different for each of us. Maybe we have a child in college, or maybe we have a child who's sick, or a parent, or someone that we care about is going through a difficult time. But anxious thoughts can start from a concern, to worry, to anxiety. It's almost like they can build up if we allow them to. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 God's word says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Notice where the peace comes from. It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from us saying, I'm not going to worry about this anymore. The peace of God comes and guards our hearts and our minds. And when I was preparing this message, I was thinking of those Israelis uh, who have had loved ones taken hostage in Gaza. How can you not worry about that? How can you not worry when you have a son or daughter who's serving uh, in a war zone? Uh, I remember a couple times in my life uh, when, uh, you know, my, my children were was 16, they, they, they got their driver's license. The first time they drove out of the driveway on their own without us in a car uh, made me very anxious to say the least. My wife took our kids over to Clarion one time to get Christmas pictures taken. And this was before her cell phones and I couldn't t talk to her. And she's a half an hour late, an hour late, an hour and a half late. And all of a sudden, the little concern I had turned into anxiety. Something happened. They're, you know, they're some, they wrecked on the road. And how our thoughts can sometimes go from little worries and concerns to anxiety. And I know that God wants us to focus on him. God wants us to be anxious for nothing Satan wants us to be anxious for everything. First Peter tells us that God wants us to cast all of our anxieties on him because he cares for us. The first thing we need to do is when we start worrying about something, when something's bothering us, when something's starting to, to affect us, give it to God. Now that doesn't mean abdicate our responsibilities and not take care of our responsibilities, but turn those concerns over to God immediately. Ephesians 2.14, and I think this is the key to understanding peace. Ephesians 2.14 says, he himself is our peace. Peace isn't a feeling or an emotion or the absence of stress or the absence of storms. Peace is the relationship found only with the relationship we have with Christ. He is our peace, not, not feelings or thoughts or the emotions that can go up and down. 
First John, in uh, John 14, 27, Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives you. Let's take a quick second and look at the difference. Examine the difference between the peace that Jesus gives us and the peace the world gives us. The peace that Jesus gives us is stable and solid. The peace the world gives us is based on feelings and circumstances and is temporary. The peace that Jesus gives us is permanent. The peace the world gives us is fleeting. The peace that Jesus gives us guards us and frees us. The peace the world gives us enslaves us. The peace that Jesus gives us transcends logic and understanding. The peace the world gives us is based on what we can see and feel and know. The peace that Jesus gives us increases our faith and trust in God. The peace the world gives us increases our faith and confidence in ourselves. Psalm 119, 165 reads, Those who love your law have great peace, and nothing causes them to stumble. So here I think we find a real key in God's word that there's a high correlation between our obedience to God in our knowledge of him and the peace that we have. So let's talk a little bit about joy. Covered peace, now let's talk about joy. The difference between happiness and joy is happiness is superficial, right? It comes and goes. Joy is something that's real deep. Did you ever have a car or truck that you loved? Uh, when I was like 20 years old, I had a Camaro Rally Sport. It was red and black, had a red leather interior. Uh, I loved that car. I can still smell that car. Uh, but you know what? That, tr that car is rusting in a junkyard right now probably, right? It was temporary. It was something that I really enjoyed and it brought me happiness, but it did, did it bring me joy, no. John 17, 13 says, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. We don't have to struggle to ratchet up our joy, to watch more Hallmark movies, to feel good about things. We get our joy from our relationship with Christ. John 15, 10 and 11 says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So now we see the common denominator again in the same thing in God's word that obedience gives us access to the peace and the joy that only Christ can give us. God's word says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. It's as simple as that. We don't have to be religious and we don't have to know a lot of things, but obedience is the true test of our love for God. We know that sin separates us from God. Obedience restores our relationship with him. James 1, 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall under various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do we count it joy when we go through various trials? I don't know if you're going through trials right now, but usually when trials come our way, we want to avoid them, right? We want them to be over and done with as quickly as possible. God's word tells us to count it all joy because trials work, give God's perfect work in us and making us complete and perfect. Remember the question I asked you before, are you perfect? We are. If we're a Christian, because God sees us through the blood of Christ, dressed in the robe of his righteousness. So here's your prescription for perfect storms and for peace and perfect joy. And we've all gotten calls from the pharmacy. Your prescription is in, right? That means you have to take something, some medication for something. And usually when you get the prescription, on the bottle, it gives you information, how to take it, make sure you finish the, the prescription, take it in accordance with your doctor's orders. So there's all kind of things on there. And God's word has a prescription for us too. 
And perfect peace and perfect joy, it's not some sort of spiritual oblivion or it's not being blind or to difficulties or pain. It's not exchanging reality for pretending everything is okay. <clears throat> Have you seen that commercial on TV where the lady is holding a, a paper uh, plate in front of her face and has a smile on it, but she's not that way? And that's what we do sometimes, right? We, we pretend everything's all right. We put on a good front, especially in church. And sometimes we're falling apart inside. And, and God doesn't want us to pretend and not, not fake that everything's fine. But peace and joy, uh, it's not hoping others can't see what we're going through. It's not that uh, because that's hypocrisy. There are two verses from God's word that should give us a foundation for peace and joy. Number one, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. All things work together for those who are called according to his purpose. That's a big verse to remember, isn't it? Because that, I don't know about you, because I look through my life and all things and still, it's difficult to understand why some things happen, but God assures us and promises us that. Then in Romans 8:36 through 38, nothing can separate us from the love of God. God's love isn't performance-based. He will never leave us or forsake us. So do we really want perfect peace and joy? Here are the five things I think that would be on our prescription from God. Number one is found in John 8. Abide in his word. We need to study his word. We need to know his word because God's word is living and active and it can change our lives. In John 15, Jesus says, abide in me. Stay close to me. So we abide in his word. We abide in him. In Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Joshua, seek him with all your heart. In Deuteronomy, love him with all your heart. That's God's prescription for us today, for peace and joy. And I'd like to use Romans 15, 13 as our benediction this morning before Ron comes again to um, complete our morning worship service. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Would you stand as we repeat this Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead and ascended into heaven, where he sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you send our way. We look out, we see the snow, and we think that it is white, Lord, and that's the way you would like to see us, whiter than snow. We thank you for those individuals that have to take care of our roads to keep us safe.
be with those who are first responders. And as Steve spoke this morning, the prescriptions of life that we think of our doctors and our nurses. We thank you, Lord, for their services to us. We pray, Lord, that Jim will receive his health back. Be with the doctors and nurses that tend to him. Be with the family, Lord. And as we think about Andre Simpkins and loneliness and life, help us, Lord, to reach out to these individuals that we know and we can help out. We think of the situation over in Israel, in Gaza, Ukraine, and the different parts of the world where there's enmity one to another. Step in in these situations. Help us to know peace and joy. Forgive us for our lacks. Help us to be the light on the hill. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward as we... We are called in virtue of our baptism to a life of service. We are equipped through the gifts of grace of the Holy Spirit. Let us live into our baptismal calling, sharing from what we have received according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Holy God, we trust in the provisions of your love and the abundance of your grace. May the gifts we offer bring glory to you in the ways they bear your love into the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>